Some of you may have picked Shalom, Tzoraim Tovim. Some of you may have picked up the uh, uh, list of drivers of rise and civilization of the Jewish people, which was laying outside. I suggest you don't read it now. Only if you are bored like hell by my speech, then you read it. Otherwise, you wait until I come back to this issue. Uh, I call Judaism a civilization, and this has been criticized because there is no better word. Uh, every term that has been used for this extraordinary uh, group of people is insufficient. Religion was valid until the 18th century, but today there are lots of Jews who want to be Jews, but not by religion. They don't follow Jewish religion, but they want to be Jews. Is, uh, are the Jews a people? There are people in France, where I spend a lot of my time, who are proud to be Jews, but absolutely not member of the Jewish people, because this conflicts with their French nationality. So are we a culture? Yes, but there is not one Jewish culture. There are 20 Jewish cultures, the culture of the Ethiopian Jews, and the culture of the liberal left-wing Jews in New York are very different cultures, but they have essential things in common. And what is in common between all Jews for the last 3,000 years, that's what I call civilization. When I started to write my book, and people asked me, what are you doing? I started to explain the methodology, then my approach to choose 23 major uh, historians who describe the rise and decline, not of Jewish, but of other civilizations, extracting from their work reasons for rise and decline, then applying this to the Jewish people. They cut me down and said, okay, not, uh, we are not a country of very patient people. Okay, cut it short. Uh, uh, tell us, uh, tell me, are we rising or are we declining? I said, both. <laughs> so they said, both, okay, goodbye. You know, we're no longer interested. So keep my reply in mind, both rising and declining. Uh, thinking about a rise and decline is a long-term exercise. There are short and long-term views of Israel and of the Jewish people. Let's look at the short-term view of Israel. Israel is a break of history. Israel is a revolution. It's a complete change and every revolution uh, creates a lot of enemies, creates a reaction which tries to undo the revolution. This happened to the French Revolution, to the Russian Revolution, to the Chinese Revolution, and it happens to us, and it can take a hundred years before people accept this revolution, uh, until the reaction to this revolution is over. But you can also look at uh, Israel in a long-term uh, perspective, and then suddenly you see Israel in a different way. Uh, Israel is, a, I like to call it, a continuation of Jewish history by other means. I paraphrase um, Clausewitz, Israel, a continuation of Jewish history by other means. Much in current Israeli history has precedence. Uh, and this allows us to set current events into a much broader, long-term historic perspective. And when we do that, we might be able to be more objective, more dispassionate, uh, more philosophical about things are happening uh, day by day. <clears throat> so it's not only an academic exercise to look at long-term history, it's an exercise to try to understand what's happening in a broader perspective. I give you a couple of, of, well, not everything is unprecedented. There are many things which are totally unprecedented in general history and in Jewish history, and they all are a result of the advancing sciences and technologies. That's why science and technology is absolutely essential for our future. I will come to that in a moment. Uh, I'll give you three examples of what is not unprecedented. A couple of years ago, one of Israel's chief rabbis was indicted for major corruption. I think the, the legal issue is still open. People said, what a scandal, horrible chief rabbi, a thief, a corrupt, this never happened before. Well, I have news for you, it did happen before. Uh, <laughs> In 1785, the chief rabbi of Vilna, which then in the 18th century was the largest Jewish city in Europe. 6,000 Jews lived in Vilna. In Berlin there were 1,000, in Warsaw 1,000. The chief rabbi of Vilna was found to be corrupt in major ways. A thief, a gangster, it was a scandal. 
unheard of, and um, the Jewish uh, community needed to get rid of him. They could not. They needed the help of the civil authorities of the city of Vilna to get rid of this chief rabbi. Now, we don't have this chance today. We would have to bring the, probably the British Mandate Authority back to Eretz Israel, which is not something I, I advise. But um, you have an example of something which many people called unprecedented, which is presidented, which has a precedent. I'll give you another example. Uh, every day you will find articles, discussions about our minority. How to deal with 20% of our people who are Arabs, Muslims, not Jews. They are members of our state. They are equal citizens, but uh, there are lots of problems. There is no issue we are dealing with that has an older history. Never in history, as far as we know, were we the only inhabitants of this country. During the whole Second Temple period, between, we don't know the figures, between 20, 30, 40 percent of the population of Eretz Israel were not Jews. And uh, there were Greeks, there were Romans, there were Arabs, there were Nabataeans, not Jews. Um, the same is almost certainly true of the first temple period, but we have no uh, statistics of that period. So it's a very old problem we have. It's very precedented. The last thing I want to say, which has a precedent in world history, is maybe the most important because it's most relevant for history. Uh, a widespread, flexible, adaptable civilization, like the Jewish civilization, does not die by external reasons alone. It disappears, dies, falls for internal reasons. This is what we learned from Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, Arnold Toynbee said it in a very succinct way, civilizations die by suicide, they don't die by external uh, murderers. And we have to keep this in mind. It means that uh, our future is to a very large degree still in our hand. Not entirely, we have Iran, we have real problems, but basically the future of the Jewish civilization is in our hand. It's what we make with it which will decide where we will be in 100 or in 1,000 years. And that we can learn from history, and it has been true all through history. Now, how do you identify rise and decline? Uh, these are very relative terms. What is rise? What is decline? It depends on where we stand in history and how long uh, a country's or a civilization's history lasts. I give you an example of short history. In the short history, it's very easy to define. Take the history of the Dutch Republic. It emerged in 1572 in its fight against, in its revolt against Spain. Uh, by 1620, which is very short afterwards, the Dutch became one of Europe's great powers, a leading commercial and naval power, uh, very high level, highest level of, sci of education and technology in Europe. They, this supported the golden age of Dutch culture, painting science. Then a deterioration set in around 1700 and by after 1789, French Revolution, the French Revolutionary Army swept the whole country away. So a history of 250 years, clearly definable rise, clearly definable decline and fall. Uh, in our case, in Jewish history, like in Chinese history, it's much more difficult to say what is rise and what is decline. It's more complex because rise and decline can occur more than once. This is why the Midrash, the rabbinic tradition, chooses the moon as a symbol of the Jewish people. You have it on my book. The Midrash Rabbah says that the Jewish people, Israel is declining and rising like the moon. We go down, we go up, we go down, we go up. <coughs> Where do we stand in Jewish history today in this long-term perspective? We are in the middle of the third deep transformation of Jewish history. The first began with the upheavals surrounding the destruction of the first temple, the second with the destruction of the second temple. The third one in which we are now started about 200 years ago with the Enlightenment, with the Haskalah, with the Emancipation, we are in the middle of it. Now, deep ruptures and transformations in Jewish history have always two things in common. 
First, the outcome is completely unpredictable at the beginning, and second, these transformations takes, uh, take a very long time. Let's speak of the unpredictability. Uh, when these transformations start, it is completely unthinkable what the end will be. In the year 70, when the, according to Flavius Josephus, the Kohanim threw themselves into the burning temple because they could not imagine that Judaism would survive without the temple, uh, until 500 years later, when a completely different Judaism, but still f loyal Judaism appeared at the end of the Talmudic period, these were two completely different things. And this Kohanim would never have believed 500 years later that the, uh, the Jews at the end, at the beginning of the Gaonic period were Jews. If they would see us today, they would say, these are Jews here? Impossible, unthinkable, completely different people. So at the end, at the beginning, we don't know what the end is. We are in the middle of uh, this period now. It could take another 200 years before we will reach the end of the third transformation. N impossible to say what Jews and Judaism will be. There will be Jews, there will be Judaism in a new form in 200 years. It takes a long time, 300 to 500 years. I don't think it will, uh, can be reduced, this time can be reduced. It will take at least 100 years, maybe 200 years before a new form of Judaism will appear. Now, we are, as I said, we are in the middle of the third transformation. This middle of the third transformation is different from the earlier ones. Why? We are today in an unprecedented, and I, this time I say unprecedented, golden age. I like the term golden age. It is the most golden of all periods of Jewish history. Never in history have Jews had a dominant economically and militarily dominant state in the Middle East, a very powerful presence in the world's first superpower, and influential presence in dozens of other countries. This never existed together. Never, according to the um, biblical mythology, the time of Shlomo HaMelech, of King Solomon, was a golden age, but we don't know about this uh, from, a historical, from a historical point of view. Of course, Jews don't see it. Uh, this is typical of golden ages. The people who live in golden ages never see that they live in a golden age. If you tell an Israeli who is just came back full of anger from the Masach Nassar, from the income tax authority, or who is upset about his problems with the Meochedet, uh, Kupat Cholim, and tell him he lives in a golden age, he will jump in your face. You know, don't try. I tried and it didn't work. It was very dangerous. Or tell him to move to Maccabi. <laughs> the same. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, golden ages are never ages of peace and happiness. They are very often the contrary. Now, what does history tell us? Tell us, history tells us that all golden ages come to an end. None lasts forever. They end after 50, 80, 150 years. So, will ours end too? Uh, can it not continue? It can continue, though we see already signs of decline. If you look at the list of uh, drivers of rise and decline, I don't know whether you saw this, it was outside. Uh, 12, I collected uh, 12 uh, drivers or reasons of rise and decline from the study of these famous historians. And you will find one, and I modified it from year to year because priorities are changing. Uh, the single most important one that I see based on what I learned from historians is political leadership and governance. Poli good political leaders can uh, allow a civilization to flourish for a long time. Bad political leaders can destroy a civilization and it happened to us several times. Uh, the two collapses of, Jewish, uh, of the Jewish state of Jewish civilization, first and second temple, were to a large degree not entirely, but a large degree caused by incompetent, bad leadership. And uh, when you look at, um, at uh, um, Israel today, uh, you see a chaotic uh, um, governance, an impossibility to keep a government in place uh, for more than two years, three years, and that's very boring. It's very boring because it doesn't allow this country to make and maintain long-term decisions, which are essential. Now, if we um, see 
a situation like this. We have to think, I'm not going to talk a lot about our leaders, uh, there is a whole stream of books, of publications, of newspaper articles uh, about this problem. Uh, when we look deeper, and then we, when we look at other civilizations, the Roman Empire, the uh, uh, Ottoman Empire, it is clear that uh, when we see a, a civilization or a culture which produced excellent competent leaders at the beginning and then after some time you have a series of incompetent, corrupt, egomaniac leaders, then something deeper is wrong. It's not the absence of great people as people believe. There's something deeper wrong with the civilization, with the people. So what is wrong with us? I don't know. I don't want to go into this. Something is wrong, can be correct, but something is wrong not just with the leadership but with the people. The second most uh, important driver of rise and decline is, science, is education, science and technology. In most, in, most, in, in most of Jewish history, the Jews had a competitive advantage over others by a higher level of education. In the 20th century, Jewish excellence in science and technology was essential in maintaining the Jewish people, in maintaining Israel. Without Israel's cutting edge in science and technology, we wouldn't be sitting here. We wouldn't have survived by now against our enemies. So I'm less pessimistic with regard to education and science uh, than with regard to governance. Not everything is OK. Uh, the statistics are contradictory. Uh, we are not yet losing our competitive advantage, but we have to be careful. Uh, a, a too large a part of the Israeli people, the Haredim, uh, the periphery, the, uh, the minorities, play no role in Israel's success in science and technology, and that is a worrying thing. Uh, I added for now, uh, for this year, military supremacy as one of the drivers of rise and decline. I don't have to tell you about the turmoil in the Middle East, about Iran. And as a question mark for the future, as a question mark for the future, I added chance events, fortune. In Jewish history, more than once, chance events have played a major role. To give you just two examples, the fact that Stauffenberg missed to kill Hitler uh, caused the life of one, one and a half million Jews who were still alive then, could st probably still be saved if Hitler had been destroyed. The, the fact that Stalin died of a stroke um, a couple of weeks after he ordered the deportation of Russian Jews into concentration camps may have saved a million Jews. So a positive and negative chance event. The interconnectedness of the world, where everything that happens somewhere has an effect on everything else makes it likely that we will be subject to chance events, good and bad future, more often than in the past. That doesn't mean they can't do anything. It all goes back to governance, to good government, making quick decisions at the right time, which we don't have. Uh, but be uh, prepared to see unexpected events, something happening in North Korea suddenly have a deep effect on us, someone important being killed suddenly, having a deep effect on our future, I think this will happen more often than in the past. So uh, I have uh, one minute left, two minutes left. Uh, something else. Well, if now, by now, you have more questions than you had at the beginning, I did my job well. Thank you very much. <laughs>